We also want to toot the BLU horn for a little while because we, uh, uh, you know, we were early adopters. Certainly MIT and some other some other academic institutions were very very hip to what the Beowulf movement meant when we were busy uploading our jobs to the von Neumann Supercomputing Center in New Jersey. It was this thing was a real windfall for local supercomputing. And that's, that was the first thing that happened when, when Beowulf technology hit the street, was everybody built their own cluster and, and had little competitions with, you know, Ohio had the stone supercomputer that was really cheap, and, and we had a couple of things here that had multiple NICs in them, so our bisectional bandwidth was, was like, you know, a gigabit per second with, with 10 fast Ethernet NICs and, and uh, you know, flat network neighborhood with switches and stuff like that. So, uh, um, so I threw this slide up there here first because I think um, I want to just talk about some of the important things that happened 10 and 15 years ago and why they're about to happen again uh, with uh, new disruptive technology. So Don Becker like literally wrote the book on Beowulf clustering. I can pass this around if you want. This was published. Don Becker has at least one degree from MIT. So uh, they went through, <laughs> through, uh, through the MIT press to publish the book. Now this, this is the second, or possibly the third edition, and he's no longer listed as, a, as an author, but they have sections, chapters in here that he wrote. So if you guys want to check this out, pretty much anything that was, was written on Beowulf computing or message passing interface, which is the, the library facil facilitator for distributed Beowulf computing, parallel virtual machines, some, some of these different infrastructure packages, you can get the book for it over at MIT Press. And the trick to getting a cheap book at MIT Press is to go in, um, eat a candy bar, smudge it, and then you come in like a week later and it'll be in the Hurt Book section. So, so I don't know if you guys know the M MIT Press bookstore, but there's a Hurt Book section. And for some reason, all the Beowulf books have like Reese's Pieces smudges on them. And, and, then, and they, they knock them down to half price if, if they're in the Hurt Book section. So, uh, um, so uh, some of these dates in here, you know, from 2000 to 2005, uh, you can see from the, from the graph here, um, I don't think the high performance computing business really knew that it was a disruptive technology because they hadn't had one yet. Well, I, I guess the, uh, the custom scalar invasion, this is, this is a lot of, this was back when, when Cray came in and out of receivership and it was owned by a volleyball company somewhere in the middle of here. Um, as soon as uh, Becker, had, Becker and, and Sterling worked together at, at Goddard in uh, uh, NASA Goddard in Maryland, and that's where they first put the, remember back then when we put little lands together, we named all the individual hosts something of the same thing. Like at Yulol, every server was named after a bird, they had an eagle and turkey and stuff like that. So I guess at, at GSFC, um, they had, uh, uh, you know, Roland and uh, Gilgamesh and Beowulf and what have you was the name of, of some of their <coughs> So kind of the Beowulf project tri trickled out of that because that was the name of their, of their head node. Um, so here's right around, so 97, they're messing around with, with uh, early Beowulf designs at, uh, at <coughs> and this is where, this is the, the, the great Clay Christensen S-curve phenomenon here. This is all the early adopters are in here, and it's kind of a slow growth period. And then when Beowulf clustering got picked up by things like, uh, like vendors, when the vendors started selling, you know, branding their literature with Beowulf clusters, then it really took off. And as you can see right now, uh, everything in the top 500 list, well, except for like two machines, is, is a scalar machine. Uh, the vast majority of them are they, they make these distinctions between. MPPs, clusters, and constellations. Well, so so like 495 out of the 500 supercomputers in the top 500 are clusters. Uh, I, I got some numbers with that later too. And 90% of the top 500 are running Linux. So really phenomenal focuses going on in, in the supercomputing business right now. Um, so remember this slide because this phenomenon is going to happen here in in 1.5 years except that it's going to be, uh, instead of it being a, a cluster phenomenon, it'll be a, an architecture phenomenon. But, I, but yeah, I wanted to throw these up here. I'm, I'm glad, we, I'm glad we, we got to be so hip to what was going on in the clustering business. Uh, there was a, a spectacular shakeout for the first couple of years. Like any new technology, there were 
a bunch of companies that branded themselves Beowulf clustering Linux white box vendors, and not too many of them are, are still around. I don't even know if Don Becker's, Don Becker's company got bought, right? Did Skilled uh, get? Yeah, he got bought by uh, Penguin. Okay, so he got. That was even before uh, he came here. Do you remember when he spoke here a couple yep. years ago? Yeah, was that 2008? I wasn't sure of the date of that. Or, but it wasn't that long ago. I, I think, yeah, in 2008. 2008. 2008, okay. So quickly, I'm not going to belabor a lot of this because I know you're all computers users and Linux users, but I just wanted to talk about this. This is one of the one of the enablers of certainly of, of cluster design and some of the phenomenons we're seeing in architecture now. And I might I might throw some questions by Shankar. Um, I think we're up right now to about 10 million transistors in maybe in maybe in a night's corner uh, die. There's there's 48 or 50 cores in in Intel's next generation 22 nanometer design die. Now I don't think they've published any of the numbers on it. We we know how many cores are in it, but we don't know how many transistors are in it for sure. Say again, four four or five million. Okay, so we've kind of come off, we've, we've gone a little bit off of Moore's Law. So this, was, so this is 45 degrees right here. That's a transistor doubling every, every 18 months, 1.5 years for, for a given die cycle. And then for the last bunch of years, it was, it was uh, probably a 30, 30 uh, uh, degree incline over, over uh, you know, normal for the last bunch of... Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't think the focus on this is going to be. So, oh, thank you, David. So, it, so maybe it looks like we're flattening out there. It uh, certainly hasn't fallen back to what it was in the last two decades. But, uh, but Moore, Moore's Law, still certainly Moore's Law for every 18 months staying true. Um, they, they're not talking about clock speeds. They never were Moore's Law was also never really a law, it was an observation, but, but it appears to be consistent, uh, and, uh, and we don't see any uh, in, uh, that ending anytime soon. What will slow down Moore's law is, uh, I've got another slide on, on, on these die sizes and the, um, and the process to, to make them. Um, so what's, what, before Moore's law dies, uh, Beowulf clustering, and the HPC business, the supercomputing business, is going to get killed by something else. And it's two things: it's the memory wall and the and the power wall. So the memory wall, we've we've been dealing with for a while. I have a I have a reference to this slide. This this slide may not be true for every supercomputing application, but Sandia did this study on, on a variety of the stuff that we're using in scientific computing, um, linear algebra, library based things and uh, for a couple of them for certainly for uh, for memory bound applications you not only don't get improved performance when you get more cores but you actually get reduced performance when you get up here around 32 and 64 core uh, processors so that kind of points out stuff that we've had to deal with for memory access all along memory has hasn't been moving as fast uh, as CPU even when it was a speed race the other problem is the, the bus widths and the amount of, when, when you go out and you buy a server today, you're getting double the PEs and the same amount of RAM. So you've got, now you've got a four and an eight, eight core server, maybe, maybe two CPUs, total of eight cores, total of 16 cores, and you're still only accessing as much RAM as 64 bits can access, uh, which is, or, or even worse, they don't put any more DIMM slots in there for you. So you're basically accessing the same RAM you, you accessed last year, with twice as many cores, so there's all sorts of sorts of bus contention going on, which is a real killer for some of the memory bound apps. But what is the real killer is the um, is the power wall. Um, the uh, the amount of juice that you're sticking into that one square centimeter these days uh, keeps increasing relative to the uh, the number of transistors in there. Um, most of my Enterprise level uh, CPUs are, you know, 100 watts TDP. Um, there's 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 a lot of green options out there, but uh, but for whatever reason, the systems we're buying come with uh, you know the 100 watt 
variety. I've seen um, um, like what's what's a green what's a tip, what's a typical AMD green processor? Using? Forty watts. Or Forty-five. Something? Forty-five. 65. Okay, so I could probably cut that in half. Um, it's still uh, the the energy density that we're we're getting to on some of these dyes is 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 phenomenal. Um, and we crossed over the, uh, this is a big deal in academia <coughs> because we, we separate our, our CapEx, the cost of buying the equipment, and our, our overhead. Um, the, the labs at MIT actually don't have to pay for the overhead, but that gets taken out of the grant when it comes in. So, so we're left over with a little piece to buy a bunch of equipment, and then the electricity is picked up by the university. Well, that used to be a deal that, that, that the university would take a couple of years ago, but they, won't, they don't like that deal anymore. In about three years, you've used more in your electrical costs than what your capex costs for the, for the kind of equipment we're buying. Um, and it's a phenomenon of um, I'm not sure what we're paying for electricity. Maybe I, I'm assuming it's probably 15 cents a kilowatt hour at least. Uh, we're looking for places. I've got a couple slides on the Holyoke project. It's about a nickel a kilowatt hour out in Holyoke. So that's so. If you want to build power-hungry computers, uh, you definitely want to get out of Cambridge. There's also um, there's also moratorium on data centers right now in, in Cambridge. You you can't if you don't already have one, like like Harvard wanted to build one. They ended up outsourcing their data center to uh, one of the telco hotels down at Downtown Crossing. They've got they've got a ton of their computational equipment down there, as well as their ISMT kind of equipment in uh, in Boston. Um, yeah, this is kind of an extension of the, the last slide. The, uh, if you're running a, a high performance center, a data center, and, and your, your customer's academia or your application is, is high performance computing, you want to keep your CPU at 99% as long as it can. Um, I know some of you guys have typed in top and you've seen 99% or 100% or 101%. Uh, a data center, a sysadmin worth of salt will, will keep the servers that are on completely full through a, a variety of uh, queuing techniques. Now, uh, he can shut off. Uh, what we'll see in a couple of slides later is Google recommends powering down servers and powering them back on. Um, this used to be not conventional wisdom, but now the startup times are somewhat insignificant relative to the run times, so they're telling you just run the number of servers that you have uh, that'll complete the job at 100% and turn everything else off. That's and if you're getting billed for the power. This happens, for example, it's flat rate. Yeah. And no incentive to write those scripts. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Just lost the wall 20000 a month. Don't care. Don't yeah. The power. Yeah. You know, crazy, but uh, yeah. the sales guy would never respond. And and so it, and it was and that was true for academia too. You know, we we nobody was metering us. We could leave the servers on for weeks before we queued a job up. Yeah. So somebody's got to change that billing paradigm in order to make it worth doing all this. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So here's what's really pushing um, the HPC business and the supercomputing business is this this DARPA report that came out two years ago. 2009, I think. So the, the, the long and short of this is, and I can show you the report, it was um, a guy named Kogi from Notre Dame was the head of the task force. He said it's gonna, we need 100 megawatts to, to power an exascale machine by any standard with <coughs> conventional design. And it's, it's conceivable that we could get to an exascale machine with, with current design techniques uh, just through just through businesses, <coughs> just getting the multi-cores in, um, ridiculous numbers of, of racks. <coughs> but, uh, uh, but clearly, you're not going to be able to, to fund e even you know an NSF-funded <coughs> or a DOE-funded supercomputing center isn't going to be able to pull that off um, without a nuclear power plant next door problem. <coughs> so, so I pulled some of my favorite uh, Amory Mullen slides that show the inefficiency. These are big piles of coal here. And by the time it gets down, this, this isn't even in the data center yet. This is my front door. Here's my data center. So when I get 100 watts in from, from this spectacular chain of inefficiency, 
then I have an even worse chain of inefficiency. By the time I get to this useful computing is, is too, uh, oh wait, it gets worse. Uh, this is to the, the power supply. And, and <coughs> from the power supply down to the CPU, we also have losses. And, I, and at least one or two of the big data center uh, outfits have captured some of those numbers. So anywhere that we can fix in here is, is, uh, is, is more cycles for us or, or a lower Varex, a lower Varex for sure. And it turns out there's, there's pretty simple fixes, well, simple on paper, um, hard to retrofit. If you're building a data center tomorrow, then we got guidelines for you. If you're retrofitting the thing that's in the fourth floor of my building, you've, you've got problems. Um, but because a lot of the big savings are up here at the, uh, at the center level. So, so here's, here's a shot of one of them. I, I think this is, so this is the Columbia River. It turns out both sides of the Columbia River are permitted for building nuclear power plants, so it's no big deal to build a data center. I mean, you're, you're probably going to use less water for cooling, for cooling for sure, and they've also got, and they're using water for, for uh, power as well. Not, not all of it. I don't think these guys are 100% um, renewable. Uh, but but the kind of uh, but you know for the 48 megawatts they need to power one of these these data centers and they've all got them Facebook Amazon Yahoo uh, going next to a river is a popular approach uh, recently there's been something of a move <coughs> to going to states that, that if they don't have hydro or they don't have um, uh, something else like cold weather they will give you tax incentives I guess there a lot of them move into North Carolina for that. So, so the reasons to put your data center out in the middle of nowhere, uh, cold air, um, lack of earthquakes and other acts of God, um, uh, cheap electricity and, uh, um, and tax incentives. So for Holyoke, uh, the uh, MIT Northeastern BU Harvard uh, consortium has at least three of those. The uh, Holyoke, the, the Commonwealth, <coughs> Wanted this center to be in Holyoke because it would create jobs and there's a lot of a lot of space out there that needed to be built on. Uh, but importantly, from the uh, consortium's perspective, it had uh, cheap electricity from right across the street, the uh, Harvard Gas and Electric, uh, uh, excuse me, Holyoke Gas and Electric, and uh, and it, that was almost entirely hydro. Although they do have some other sources of electricity in, in Holyoke, um, and I have slides on that too. So the top 500 list comes out twice a year. It comes out at the, um, at the International Supercomputing Conference, which unfortunately, I thought it was going to be earlier this year. It's not till next week. So I don't have the latest and greatest top 500 numbers for you, but we got a rough idea of, of what's going to be there. The, uh, the, the big one, the two petaflops cluster in, in China has outfitted uh, Tianhei with with GPUs now, so that might be three petaflops. We don't know, and that that's right on track with Moore's law. Um, the uh, there's a bunch of new data centers coming out with uh, Blue Gene P and I think Q. I think Q was coming out this year, so Blue Gene Q might be the end of the line for Blue Gene. I don't. If if Bill was here, we could ask him what the roadmap for for Blue Gene was. Um, and then a lot of other things that probably won't be surprised. You know, the, a lot of the DOE uh, supercomputers, they jump up and jump down. Uh, Oak Ridge Jaguar is in the top five right now, but it might be bumped down. Los Alamos Roadrunner might make it back up if they, they sometimes retrofit these machines, stick the new processor in and pull the old one out so they can jump back up. I think that's what's going to happen at, at Los Alamos. So, so Los Alamos National Labs Roadrunner is one of my favorite <coughs> cluster designs because they had um, it was they call it reverse computing they kind of pioneered this approach they have um, opterons and um, these uh, QS22 uh, IBM QS22 blades that are populated with cell broadband engine well they do all of their computation on the cell broadband engine so they kind of called it this sort of, they're kind of functioning as accelerators like a GPU CPU combination and uh, and 
uh, they were getting just spectacular results um, <coughs> at single precision with integrated refinement for a long time. And I, I've got a couple of slides on, on, on the Sol Broadband engine. It broke my heart when they discontinued that product. It may make a comeback. Um, that's another thing we're going to have to ask Bill if, uh, if some of these new power uh, uh, processors are going to have SPEs in them or something similar. Okay, so the green 500 list is <coughs> it's, it's a repackaging, uh, it's substantially a repackaging of the, of the top 500 list. But instead of just raw floating point operations per second, it's flops per watt. So as you might imagine, this, this completely flips the list around. There's a lot of blue genes up at the top of this list. Blue gene is remarkably energy efficient for what it does. It's, not, it's still a power hog, but you, know, you still need the 48 megawatts, but, uh, but you get uh, uh, a spectacular amount of processing for, the, for that kind of wattage. And now there's, there's a couple of other interesting lines in here. The, the grape is... Um, a specialized processor designed in Japan, and they were very bullish on it for years. Uh, the grape has somewhat been eclipsed with uh, the, the, the immediate phenomenon that's going on right now is everyone's either retrofitting their old uh, supercomputing gear with GPUs, or they're starting fresh with, with a, a, a board CPU, GPU combination, multiple GPUs in some cases. And these are, in almost every vendor, all the, all the tier one vendors are packaging a, a GPU solution. You can call up HP and say, hey, I want your, I want your, your rack that has, has your combination of Opterons and, and uh, GPUs, and, and they, they have a product that'll fit that definition. Everybody's selling GPUs. And certainly, uh, the vast majority of the supercomputers that are gonna be at the top of the list in, in uh, June 19th and November 19th are going to have GPUs in them. All right, so here's a, a picture of the, uh, wasn't really a groundbreaking. They're still a couple of years away. If you go to Holyoke right now, there's some wooden stakes in the ground with little orange flags on them. That's about where they are. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of, um, of meeting. There's, there's various groups that meet on, on the design. I think they've probably settled on some design issues, but no construction has started yet. So uh, it'll be uh, uh, at least a year before you see any activity out there. I think, I think they're shooting for a mid-2012. Uh, okay, so I don't, know the, I don't know the latest on this, but I can find out. Because this is, there's gonna be a lot of changes before they start putting uh, gear in at Holyoke. And it's going, it's gonna be a spectacularly large facility. It's certainly gonna be an exit byte facility, or excuse me, eggs a bit. If you get 125, uh, you know, petabits, wait a sec, an, an eighth of an exabyte is an exabit. Okay, so, so it'll at least be an exabit facility, or maybe it's a petabit facility. Anyway, there's a <laughs> they, they've specced out the price of, uh, of, of that solution. One thing they, they really want to work on there, which might distinguish themselves from some of these other uh, grid connected, uh, you know, TerraGrid connected research centers is they want to be the, the massive data uh, you know, research center. And we've got all sorts of projects locally that, that could take advantage of, uh, of petabits of storage. Um, certainly, uh, you, you get into those kind of numbers when you do genomics and, and brain research. Okay, so here's, here's my list of 10 things that, that I think are kind of global for the next round of data center designs, but I'll, re I'll pull out some of these that, that are exemplified by, by the, the, big, the big thought leaders right now are Facebook, Google, and in, in specifically scientific Beowulf computing, the Blue Waters facility at uh, the University of uh, uh, Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and uh, uh, they have all really captured some of these things that take, take us from that 100, that, that 95 watt loss out of 100 in at the data center and get us down to about a 13 watt loss out of that 100 watts. And they did the big things right, the, like taking out the massive UPS that applies to the whole data center that, that was, nobody needed that. It was re redundancy that didn't need to be there. Um, to the little things, like getting your your Atlas library perfectly tuned for for every every uh, you know board and uh, 
processor combination you had. It turns out there's equal parts, single changes that, that make a big difference and lots of little changes that make almost an equal uh, change, uh, equal level change to what the big ones do. So the, uh, this is the one I was talking about earlier where if you can, if you have um, a consolidation technique that burdens your, your servers 100% and then shuts off servers that you're not using, uh, that, that's, that's what I mean by that phrase. Um, there's a little bit of, when you're, when you're the sysadmin at a data center, especially in scientific computing, you can work a little bit with the, um, with the end user. Um, at MIT, we're constantly getting grad students come in and say, hey, at my last school we used, uh, you know, Slurm or, uh, you know, some uh, Maui combination, Torque and Maui, and we say, well, you know, we use SunGrid Engine here and, and suck it up. Uh, sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have to talk to the guy's professor if you tell him that. Uh, but uh, but that problem is substantially going away. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of consolidation on Sun Grid Engine, for instance. Um, so, uh, locally. Oh, I'm going to talk a little bit on the num numerically efficient approach. So in the early days of GPU, they, they, they couldn't do double precision. Double precision is really important in some areas of scientific computing. It's because this dialogue has been on the table now for a couple of years, it's becoming less important. Um, a lot of what we do uh, at MIT is we run a simulation at single precision because it's uh, sometimes eight times faster than double precision. And we detect a few trends, or more importantly, we detect uh, some, some uh, blind alleys. And then we, we don't look down the blind alleys, and then we go over to the double precision gear, the stuff with CPUs in it, and, and we run the full simulation uh, with, with this reduced uh, uh, data set. Uh, another solution that, that we're going to be looking at this summer, uh, I've got a couple of the students that are working with me here this, this summer is to run it at single precision with constant uh, checks against your double precision uh, uh, error aggregator. And you get at least sufficient uh, to, um, the, the standards board that, that determines whether or not you've passed the LINPAC according to uh, the parameters that you're allowed to run LINPAC at and thereby enter into the top 500 list, they used to have real problems with the single precision GPU approach. And now the GPUs are IEEE 764 compliant, so now they don't really have too much trouble with running things at double precision native. Well, also recently, they said you can use this iterative refinement approach. If you're running single precision, as long as you're doing your, your error checking at double precision IEEE 764 compliant, we'll, we'll accept that as LINPAC tests, and then we'll you know, consider you for the top out earn list. Certainly, none of the gear I'm, I'm working with is eligible for the top 500 list. You've got to be, well, to be at the top of it, you've got to be a petaflops machine. And to be at the bottom of it, I think you have to be 600 teraflops. So, uh, but we're looking at the green 500 list. I like, our, I like our, our performance to power ratio so far. I'll talk a little bit about that. Mm, did that move? No. Okay. So I have one of the, one of the data center approaches I'll talk about briefly is Microsoft's. They, they had a couple good slides, and I'll give you the link to, to where I got their slides from. The way you compare data centers is with uh, power utilization uh, efficiency quotient. Now, the, the green grid came up with this and got consensus from, from manufacturers in Japan, and so that's why PUE is something of the, of the standard for comparing data centers. Um, for a while there, some people were cooking the books with calculating PUE. You, you can't get a, a PUE less than one, and they were reporting like 0 0.9 because they were reusing some of the heat to, uh, uh, to heat the condition space where the offices were, and you can't really do that. So the green grid has come out with a couple of, uh, couple of new ones. Uh, ERE is one of the new ones they're pushing. They haven't had, had complete buy-in from all the, all the countries that have to sign off on using this as, a, as an interoperable standard. That's uh, energy reuse efficiency metric. Um, but they've got some other ones too. Um, but PUE is how we're going to compare all these guys for, for a while. 
Microsoft had, <clears throat> right now, they're in the third generation of the data centers. I don't have any pictures of that one because I wanted to talk about their fourth generation. But they have, um, they have a data center that, that's, that's, I think, in construction, but it's certainly very fleshed out in uh, design where you just pull up with your, your ISO container, drop it off, there's three umbilicals, you just back it in, drop it down, plug in network, whatever your cooling fluid is, um, and I think that's it, maybe there's just two umbilicals. And it's, uh, it's a hermetically sealed container, uh, you only have to go in after whatever your pain threshold is, after six servers die or something, then you, you, you open the, the submarine door and you go in and you replace those servers. But now, so what's, what's important about this is, you know, this, this shipping container is now the unit of, of the, the unit metric at the data center. Mm -hmm. It used to be, you know, the server, and then for a while there it was the rack, and now it's like just bring a whole truckload of racks up and, and you never have to go in, everything's all configured to the way you want it. And more importantly, if you're getting these, uh, all the big vendors have a solution that's in a shipping container. If you call up HP and say, hey, I need an upgrade. They don't come in and pop out your, your sockets and stick the latest processor in. They, they rehab the interior of that shipping container, or maybe they just give you a new shipping container, and you get a, you get a, um, you, a, a stocking, a, you know, a restocking fee on returning the old container. Uh, so uh, certainly Holyoke is looking at this. Uh, this pre-assumes a couple things, that, that you're using one of these liquid cooling solutions. Uh, there's a, 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 a lot of, of the scientific computing community thinks that, that liquid computing is, is the future. Uh, and they can certainly demonstrate that on energy efficiencies. Uh, I've got that coming up uh, here shortly, but I have one more. One more. Uh, Any uh, other questions now, or do you want to wait to wait? Oh no, no, yeah, uh, throw them in now. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking on the shipping containers. So, are they optimized to be able to quickly copy the data from the old one to the new one when they ship out a new container? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say probably not. They probably the vendor probably says that's a that's a, a customer problem. It seemed to me that uh, there's an opportunity to design those things so you so they're massively parallel uh, when you connect one to another. Yeah. To be able to sync the data between the two. Oh yeah, yeah. It would be a lot easier for the vendor built that in than to have the customer do it. Yep. Yep. That's a good question. Maybe there's some specialized net network cable you can put between them. Optical. Um, so this is one of the other things. Here's here's the link to the entire presentation. A uh, guy named Sean Harris did it. Uh, the the conventional wisdom now is that you know you still got your hot aisle and your cold aisle even within a shipping container. It's just that your cold aisle is 80 degrees. This is your cold aisle. Imagine you know in the hot aisle is everybody's been behind a server blowing hot air. So your hot aisle is still probably pretty hot, but an 80 degree cold aisle. So it's and kind of like global warming in a box. It's, I know it is. It's the market. See, we're we're partially causing the problem that we're trying to solve with this supercomputer center. So, and the way they got there was, you know, the, the um, manufacturers will tell you, uh, you know, our, our equipment can tolerate higher temperatures than what ASHRAE is recommending for. There's, a, there's a, a lead standard that's coming out for data centers. The EHPC IEEE task force is, is writing this up. I haven't quite got there yet, but they, they thought this was a little bit too restrictive. This is... They said, "Look, we can we can tolerate all sorts of all sorts of temperatures up here. So let's let's make 80 like the lower end rather than the rather than the, the upper end. So so cold aisles of 80 degrees are in are in all these these data centers. I'll show you now. Um, like the 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 Primeville facility at Facebook has the market the industry lowest PUE, and uh, and they got there through a." a, a unbelievable effort of, of probably two or three hundred small little fixes that all added up to this to this, uh, to this industry low metric. Um, it's way too big to be a shipping container. I, I know. Okay, so they're still, they're still an old, and them and Google, well no, actually less, less so with Google. I'll show you the, the Google one. The Google one is, is a long hallway with these modified shipping containers that are, are little offshoots from it. 
So uh, Google mixed a little bit of like Gen 3 and Gen 4 design. Um, the Primeville facility at Facebook is, is, is uh, that's, this is definitely the traditional data center walk-in facility. Um, and, and they made all of their stuff public on this opencompute.com site. They talked in very great detail about the schematics of their server design. So they, so they went and revisited almost everything and, you know, the motherboard, the CPU placement, you know, where the blowers were. Um, both of them and Google have gone to this local UPS rather than the uh, uh, enterprise-wide UPS. They took that out of there, and there's a little UPS that buys you. Uh, remember the APCs, UPSs that had the serial cable, and it would, would send a, you know, a safe shutdown command? Okay, so they have this, and they probably got like 30, per second, 30 seconds of battery on this UPS, just enough time to do a safe shutdown. Uh, and uh, like I say, what's remarkable about Facebook is that they've, they've made all this public. They put it on this, this open compute site. Um, they've shown the design. They've got these things, uh, I think they're called tripods or something. They're bringing, they're, instead of bringing the electricity in at, at you know, 13.2 kilovolts, stepping it down and then stepping it down and then running it to an EPS and doing an AC-DC conversion and a couple of inefficient step downs, they're running all the way to the rack at 277 volts AC uh, and, and then going right into the server. So there's, there's no, uh, there's just the, uh, the switch gear of the electricity coming off the street uh, from the power utility uh, company and, and then the step down that's on the, on the machinery. There's, there's no, there's no um, uh, boxes in between like there are at most data centers. Most data centers ran the, uh, the servers at either 112, you know, 120 volts or in some cases 240 volts, but it all came, came down through a couple of step converters. And, uh, and, and if we adopt the open compute model, you can run 277 or 480 volts right, right, to, the, right to the servers now. Yeah, they, they've, they added a spectacular amount to the dialogue. You can get each one of their uh, design drawings on, on their, their modified UPS, their modified um, <coughs> power breakout, um, breakout boxes in their, in their racks. Um, so here's second on the list, a close second <laughs> at 1.09. Yeah, is, uh, uh, is the Google Data Center C. So I think Google now has probably, they, they certainly have a Google Center data, data Center I, so they probably have, have maybe 15 or 16 data centers, but C was their, the one that they, they put together where they were going to demonstrate uh, a lot of their value adds um, in terms of energy efficiency. Um, one thing they did, I thought this was pretty clever, instead of, so you probably recognize all of those, a typical power supply to a motherboard, you know, the ATX connector is what, 24 pins or something? You got a plus 12 and a minus 12 and a plus 5 and a minus 5. Well, now they've just got the single voltage coming on the motherboard. So here's, so they, this is where all the really efficient VRMs and uh, DC DC converters are. And you're sending your 12 volt and your 5 volt to your disk just like you are over here. But you don't need to duplicate all of the, uh, um, uh, all of the voltage conversion. So, so they start. So that's how they're getting. They're, they went from a this is a commodity power supply that gets eighty five percent efficiency, and now they're getting ninety two percent efficiency. Uh, and more importantly, they're they're measuring this. So PUE only calculates from where the electric company plugs into your brick wall to where you plug into the power supply on your server. Well, they they're calculating it now down to to here, and here, and so. They've got another metric for that. I forget what that's. I think that's called TPUE, uh, total, total power usage. Anyway, I've, uh, I'll dig that up. So if you go to this site, they they used to have 10, 10 best practices. Now they've just got the five. But they go into some detail about how you know if you've got constant feedback, if you've got gangly up and running and reporting back to you what your what your energy efficiencies are, and you got some scripts that kick in. If, if somehow you fall down to 80% uh, utilization, then you stick in some of these lower nice level jobs to get you back up to 99%. They, they're on top of that. Um, How much of 
this, uh, I mean, it sounds like this example and the other ones, like everything in this space is going full custom, except perhaps the CPU chips themselves. Um, well, these, they're, Google had enough leverage with Supermicro to place an order that made it a commodity solution. So that, that I could go and order yeah. in quantities more. Yeah, um, it, it was kind of it was kind of a hybrid between, uh, you know, Beowulf clustering is all about. Tom Sterling says we we live off the crumbs off the off the right. ga gamers tables. So uh, um, so this this became a commodity solution because of the volume of the order. Uh, but they they had some interim solutions where it, it was tough to find a motherboard that, that would take take just a single voltage and then and then all the, the breakout stuff was on here. They, I think that was one of their big value adds was leveraging that that modification. I mean, I'm I'm just wondering. I mean, I understand that the power and the infrastructure costs are are now more, but as you get into custom hardware. My experience over the years is custom hardware is two, five, ten times as expensive as commodity hardware, and then maybe you you spend less on power, but you spend five times as much money on the hardware. Yeah, so I so I I'm pretty sure they got commodity pricing because of the volume order on at least part of this. Uh, the 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 local UPS, and I'll pull up a picture of uh, Facebook has this extended case. Where they stuck a local UPS and uh, and they got something else in there, um, I so I think that probably added. I don't see a commodity solution for that, unless they just bought a bunch of batteries and, and strung this together themselves. That that's a possibility. Um, I know Google is famous for for paying students with a bunch of pizzas to translate documents. So uh, so maybe the, maybe they had a weekend where everybody was str stringing together batteries. <laughs> Well, as it becomes a standard way of doing things, then you're up against the same customization a year and a half later when you want to refresh the tech. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're Google or Facebook, how do you make it happen? That's right. Yeah, you should wait for Google or Facebook to make some new innovation. It'll turn into commodity at their volumes, and then you oh, yeah. and grab uh, Yep. And, and that open compute project, it, it's, it's, a re, it's kind of a call for proposals. Join the team. You know, if you've got any suggestions, there's... Um, uh, there's a open open storage dot com open pod. There's I'll, I'll dig up that URL. There's there's at least another open initiative on on how to get denser uh, server racks. I think it's called or, open storage pod. Uh, and they had uh, they had an interesting design that kind of came out of uh, one of these groupthink phenomenons. It was a Google group for a while, and now it's its own website. And it's it's a pretty good, not quite five nines. Uh, uh, server solu uh, or storage solution that uh, that's that's certainly a lot cheaper. If, you, if you're willing to give up some, uh, as as Google, uh, th this clearly came into their thinking. It's like let's put a UPS on it, and then we don't have to worry about making it a seven nines reliable server system. We'll just we'll just make sure that we never lose data. Um, so they have so they have failures all the time. They just don't get around to turning them back on until. Uh, you know, until there's like maybe two servers that are down in the same in the same shipping container. So I only have I only have one other data center that I thought was exemplary and enough to show you. These so this is this is our original slide again. Here's the electricity coming in from the street um, at typical grid voltages, and they got rid of their enterprise UPS and their power distribution unit, and they're going straight in here. At, at 480 instead of 277 like Facebook. So I'm not sure. I don't. I don't have any any gear. This is probably all blue jean. I would assume that's for 480 volt gear. Um, this isn't quite built yet. Certainly not built yet enough to run Linpack and find out if they're going to be a top 500 machine. But but when they do, it's probably going to be a 10 petaflops facility, and uh, that'll probably happen in January of next year. There's another couple of shots. They considered doing air cooling, but they ran the PUE numbers on air cooling and said, no, no, it turns out there's a certain percentage of our equipment that we can't cool with, uh, um, with water. Uh, I, I assume the vast majority of the stuff, the blue jean stuff, that's all water cooled. Uh, there was also a, they had to get past quite a bit of um, 
and this is water cooling, this isn't foreign or anything. They gotta get past a certain amount of, of uh, institutional bias against water cooling. Uh, there's, there's not much chance of, of, of any of this stuff bursting. I mean, it, it, there's more, more dangers likely than, than, uh, than some sort of a catastrophic water failure, yeah. A lot of your liquid cooling is not water. Um, well, the stuff to the machines, you mean? So they, they're doing... There's a, there's this technology out there where your liquid cooling isn't water. Yeah. It's a non-conductive fluid, and that's what's used to transport the heat. Yeah. So if you do rupture a pipe, it's not an electrical problem. Yeah. Uh, it's not a contamination problem. Yeah, and the chances of you rupturing a pipe are extremely low. These things are... Are, are built out of the built built out of better metal than the servers for sure. Um, here again, this is from the this is from the same conference as that Microsoft slide. This was called the the Data Center of the Future conference, and there were a bunch of bunch of interesting presentations there. Yahoo had one. Um, I just threw this in the um, uh, when I get to my slides about what what the homebrew community has brought forward. Uh, there's one that that says you know we we can get a certain amount of performance out of commodity cores like tin silica. So this is tin, a tin silica core is not quite a cell phone core. It's a it's a more of an FPGA. But but D. E. Shaw does this fixed precision math on it, and it just it just absolutely screams. And of course, he uses this for uh, for for making trades on Wall Street. So it must be a good design because he's gotten quite wealthy from that. And um, I got I have more slides on. Another project. Use this for like yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So this is so Anton, <coughs> right? And it, and this is like four times faster than any other molecular dynamics code, right? Or a, a, pr a protein folding code. Yeah. So that that's spectacularly compute intensive stuff. Like to get a fifteenth of a second of a protein fold is like, you know, a couple hundred thousand hours of CPU, right? But they have a custom ASIC to do that because they don't use the CPU. Yeah. So I wanted to tear through. I was hoping Kevin Gleason would be here, but I wanted to tear through some of my early Beowulf clusters. So <laughs> Kevin Gleason and I went to Supercomputing 2002, and we did the previous machine. This was in the in the basement of uh, of the old NE49, which was the CCL building. I think I think Simpson Garfinkel had thrown it out because he he was writing articles uh, about what next machines, what kind of gases they give off when they burn. <laughs> so, so there was a whole bunch of broken next cubes in the basement, and we built this was a three-node Beowulf cluster. The uh, we took the optical drive out and we put a power supply in, and we put three nodes in. So it was a three-node Beowulf cluster with three necks each. So it was a, uh, you know, fully interconnected, not quite hypercube, but um, uh, but we started bringing clusters to supercomputing uh, every year after that, and and we. Um, um, I'm going to jump ahead to SC08. Uh, I got these slides out of order from supercomputing, but SGI just before they went belly up for about 20 minutes, they had this design that was going to be this this big two-dimensional uh, processor bus interconnect, and you'd just shove atoms into it. So they called it the molecule, and they had designs on paper at least for like you know 1,000 atom molecules. And I don't know whatever happened to this. Certainly, I don't think Rackable has done anything with it. But they showed this this mock-up at, at Supercomputing 08. Um, this one wasn't at Supercomputing, but this was one of my examples of how how the the, um, the homebrew industry is driving uh, some of the design work at the at Big Iron now. Intel actually, the the guy at, at Carnegie Mellon that designed Fawn, he was uh, his work was funded by Intel. And Intel, so Fawn never had atoms in it, though. It had um, Socris um, and geodes. Uh, and what he wanted to demo, I think what he successfully demoed, was he was running memcache at a spectacularly lower power level than Facebook. You know, Facebook is mostly memcache. And he, was, he wanted to show that you can run memcache. Um, he also demonstrated, I forget what LinkedIn's primary application is or, or Voldemort's, uh, but he, uh, 
he basically threw this out there. Hey, you can, for if you don't care about floating point precision of any variety, singled or double, and uh, you don't even really care too much about integer math, you can run some of these applications on, uh, on, on ARMS and, and SOCRIS and GEODES. And I think that was the point that he was making. Unfortunately, Intel said, oh, well, let's run them on ARMS. So Adam still, for better or worse, Adam still have all the baggage that you get when you get with an x86 processor. And, uh, and they're getting the, the power down on Adams, but they're not quite getting it to the level of your, uh, of, um, of AMD geodes or, uh, or arms yet. So this was my take on Fawn. So uh, these are MIPS processors. And here again, if you're only running one application, and it's not very math intensive, or if it is math intensive, you can do it in fixed precision. You can certainly use MIPS processors for that. So we did this last summer. We're going to, at BLU, was the solar supercomputing project. We're doing it again this summer in, in some context. Um, like I said, I got my, my students helping me out this summer to port some of these supercomputing applications over to single precision capable processors like the MIPS and the ARM and then see if we can just fix the double precision on the head node when we, when we collect up our, um, our data. Um, at Supercomputing 4, so the, the Linux lunch bo Lunchbox, this is Sandia's design, and so is this. Now this is kind of when this stopped being a joke, because at Supercomputing 05 in Reno, they had a convention center-wide power outage, except, so the only cluster that was up full time, there was a car battery in here. So the, the, this one had full uptime, and all of a sudden, <coughs> these quirky designs that are built out of carcasses and, and uh, you know, uh, we had one that we called a pizza box that was in a Bertucci's pizza box. And these were, we used to do this, you know, MIT and Sandia would do it back and forth, every supercomputing uh, kind of tongue in cheek. But now all of a sudden it was serious and they, they were getting press coverage. So after SC05, uh, excuse me, SC05, it was it was 06 or 07. Um, then then we st started getting serious. So so last year we joined forces with Sandia, and uh, I got my next shirt on there. So I've, I've got lots of next machines. If you guys <laughs> want to do anything with next machines, I do four in my attic. Okay. Do you really? Yeah, I've been touched for like 15 years. So there 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 was a Linux port to next for a while. I don't know where that went. So it's, <laughs> it's like maybe we should re revisit that. But. Uh, so this is the Panda board I got uh, from, from, we had that uh, TI came and gave us the Panda uh, demonstration here at, at uh, BLU, like the week before I went to supercomputing. So I went, I got that and demoed it um, at, this is the Sandia booth, I'll show you the MIT booth later. And then I have a picture of this here. There's a, they're being very quiet about this, but that is the, is the Sandia uh, strong box. So I can pass this around if you want to look at it. It's 196 gum sticks. And so the good thing about the gumstick is they have these, these stagecoach things where you plug the gumstick in and you don't have to eat up an ethernet cable until the end of the line, which is I think, I think you can put seven gumsticks into a, into a stage. And uh, <laughs> um, so I think we may, for the project I'm gonna talk about after this, I think we may be revisiting this design. It's, the gumstick is an ARM Cortex-A8, which is not the Panda board generation of ARM court, uh, ARM uh, processor, but it's like last year's. It's the Marvell Shiva plug generation. Uh, so we may have like a mixed cluster with the ARM Cortex A8. But if you guys want to see this, I, they're they're very tight-lipped about this. I have a real hell of a time trying to find pictures of this, and it was like you know they were showing it on the on the convention room floor. So I'm not sure why it's hard to find a picture of it. There should be tons more flicker. I <coughs> I know, but. Just to get that picture, I had to go into Ron Minnick's account with his authorization key, just to get that one lousy picture. And so I, kept, I actually searched for Flickr, and Flickr didn't have any. Anyway, one thing that happened at last year's supercomputing, which caught me way off guard, was we, we had this little booth over in the, in the top right corner of the New Orleans Convention Center, and nobody was coming by our booth. We were at the very edge of the disruptive technologies uh, section. Well, come day two, and Clay Christensen is the keynote speaker, and I, if, I hope you guys know who Clay Christensen is. He, he literally wrote the book on disruptive technologies, um, came and gave everybody a, a huge helping of, of, uh, 
of Crow at the uh, at the supercomputing conferences because he was talking to stuff that struck really close to home. Um, and the the one thing that that I've got this little I don't have the whole presentation here, but I got a couple of key slides where he went through and he told the Dell ASUS story. And he went through it's 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 you can get this online this whole presentation. I just took snapshots of it. Went through where he said, well, some middle manager made this this the right decision given the information he had about how ASUS kept going back to Dell and saying, hey, you know, you guys aren't really in the motherboard business. You should really outsource that to us. And I'll fast forward to the punchline. They kept, you know, uh, nibbling away at, at Dell's uh, business model uh, because each one of these made sense. You know, a couple of years down the road, ASUS had better supply chain than, than Dell. And it's like, Dell, go ahead and, and outsource that to us. Well, they work all the way up the chain, but when they get up here, instead of coming back to Dell and saying, hey, you know, you should really outsource your brand, they went to Best Buy and they said, hey, you know, you should really buy computers from ASUS. And that's, that's exactly what happened. So I, I don't know where, where Dell is um, right now in uh, PC sales at a place like, like Best Buy. Um, I know they still have a, a really strong foothold in, in selling racks to uh, you know, universities, so to outfitting data centers. Um, but that, that has to hurt. You know, when, you, when you consider that you're, you're kind of uh, cutting off some of your unprofitable divisions to somebody that is efficient at it, and then you discover that you're giving away the whole farm, it doesn't really creep up on you until the very end there. So that was a pretty interesting story. And Christensen, he, he uh, doesn't talk very much because he's recently had a stroke. This was a real coup that he, he'd, he'd speak at this conference. And uh, so after his lecture, all of a sudden the disruptive technologies booths were getting tons of business. So. All right, so uh, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna get done early if I, if I stay on pace here. I have, um, I'm going to talk quickly about, this is a slide that, um, on how Lincoln Labs assess their usage. It, it turns out that, you know, somebody says, hey, I need all 2,000 processors. And you say, okay, well, do you really need them? And they say, yeah. And they say, well, what are your usage patterns? And they'll, they'll probably tell you something that doesn't match up very well in reality. What a lot of people do is, and this is almost, the, the counts are predictable here. They'll run their application two or three times just to see if it's doing what they want, and then they'll hit go, and then they'll, they'll run it for two weeks and utilize 90% to 99% of, of the processors that you've allocated to them. So there's two or three ways to, to interact with a, a customer that needs that kind of queuing system. One is virtualize the daylights out of your, out of your cluster. This is what um, Renzi does uh, in North Carolina, is you can request 3,000 cores if you want them, and they'll they'll give you 3,000 virtual PEs, and if you only if you interact with them and and you know and there's a gap between using them, some of these other jobs will take your place while you're while you're interacting with with your virtual machines. Um, and in the case of Lincoln Labs, they uh, they they give you um, um, it, it's a, a similar solution. They'll give you a number of exclusive uh, uh, PEs so that you can interact with it, tune your code, and then when you're ready to go, then they stick you into the big queue. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's one of my, one of my slides. Uh, they do a lot of GPU work down the street. Harvard's the NVIDIA Center of Excellence uh, in academia, um, and I think there's, so Oak Ridge is, is an NVIDIA Center of Excellence. Well, they do a lot with NVIDIA GPUs down the street, and they were perfectly happy with last year's generation of NVIDIA GPUs. The ones that, so we're right now on Fermi. Uh, earlier ones were Tesla. So Tesla did single precision, you know, to beat the band. Uh, not as well double precision. Fermi's a little bit farther along. Um, uh, for if you need native double precision, but they were perfectly happy with with single precision at Harvard because because you get uh, faster speeds across virtually the entire spectrum of supercomputing applications when you're running in single precision, and then you just have to if if your customer needs double precision or you somehow have to validate the numbers you add you come up with, 
then then you have you can do this iterative refinement correction. Um, they even found out uh, this is a Mike Clark slide. Uh, they even found out that they're getting sometimes slightly faster times uh, at half precision um, or some other uh, fixed precision. And here's why you sometimes get better speeds with single precision is uh, you, get, uh, you get more operations out of a single precision cycle. And uh, um, this, I have the link to this presentation. This presentation, there's a presentation by Gertica at the NVIDIA conference, and there's one by Jack Dongara at, um, at a conference that say why, why working in single precision is acceptable to the mathematicians and the statisticians if you're doing this, uh, um, if you're checking after, um, I think it's something like every 20 iterations, you gotta do a, a double precision check. Um, and that, I won't belabor this one, this is another slide that supports the former. Okay, so let's start talking about the technology we're looking at this summer. Um, ARM has come a long way in a year. They had, uh, they had some combination ARM core GPU uh, uh, processors on the board uh, at, at you know last year's supercomputing. Well, now there's a, they're on the street. You know, uh, uh, this particular one they're talking about here, this is from a, a, a YouTube video, um, is with the Mali GPU. The ones we're going to be testing out this summer, the, the Panda board has a, uh, uh, I believe it's STX480. It's a PVR GPU, basically. On it. You can get OpenCL and run it on the Panda board, which is a, which is a really big deal for anybody who's done CUDA programming. The path to OpenCL is is a fairly straightforward one. So we're we're pretty happy so far in what we've been seeing on the Panda boards. Uh, there's some other architectures out there that have different kind of, of GPU, but the the good news is that they do have a GPU. We can get a little bit more math. Out of out of uh, out of these boards, if they have a GPU on them. Um, this came out a month ago. Jack Dungar wrote Linpack. He's the head of the HPC Challenge. He's the guy that determines uh, him and the guy that runs ISC <coughs> determine whether or not you're going to get on the top 500 list. He's looking at iPads, so I iPad twos rather. So the iPad two is, I think they, they call it an Apple A4 core A5. A5. Okay, and he's theorized that. <coughs> He's having problems right now. He can only run Linpack on one of the cores, and we're, we're discovering this with our Panda boards. I don't know what we're doing wrong quite yet with, with compiling Linpack, but he can only run it on one core on the iPad 2, and we can only run it on one core on the Panda. It may be something simple. Uh, <laughs> we're certainly going to look into it. He thinks he's going to be able to get uh, 1.2 or 1.5 gigaflops out of, out of an iPad 2 on Linpack. Which is all of a sudden now. This is this is something that you might think about building a Beowulf cluster out of, and uh, this was a joke a couple <laughs> months ago. But uh, but we're so we're, on our Panda board, we're getting 600 megaflops out of out of one of our cores. So that that bodes well. We might be able to get up to 1.2 as well if we could figure out what we're doing wrong. And we haven't even tapped the GPU yet. Um, I don't know if I don't know what they have for GPUs on on iPad 2s. Maybe maybe nothing. But hey, 1.5 gigaflops out of an iPad 2. They don't have Ethernet. Uh, this could be a problem if you're building <laughs> clusters out of it. We do have Ethernet. It's fast Ethernet. And there's also another really interesting interconnect on the Panda board. Uh, are you familiar with On The Go? Uh, so if you want to power your, your Panda board, you take your USB cable and you plug it into the micro USB cable. And it comes on. And more importantly, uh, it'll accept, uh, at least on paper, 480 megabits per second data rates. So we're like, man, we don't need fast Ethernet. We've got on the go. So we're looking at that this summer. Uh, this uh, is uh, a product that we found looking around. I think we're going to get one of these to evaluate. One of our goals this summer is to run Linpack and possibly some of the other HPC challenge ben benchmarks on these things and see if, see if ARM Cortex-A9 or worse is is worth worth looking at for uh, for HPC clustering. Um, we're pretty sure the ARM Cortex A8 stuff is is uh, probably not the best place to be right now. There's um, I didn't bring a slide of it, but there's a, a university in Germany that's building clusters out of um, Apple TVs, 
and those are those are ARM Cortex A8 class. It's it's the iPad, not, not the iPad 2, but the iPad class, or Apple processor, and their their initial findings were pretty negative. They're getting lousy lin packs, um, you know, the the kind of lin pack you get with this. Um, if you download lin pack on my HTC Hero, I get I get like uh, 50 mega flops, and the ones that are at the top of the list are closer to 100 mega flops, and I'm not really sure what they're doing. Well, they're doing them on other on other phones for sure. The HTC Heroes are probably around 50 megaflops everywhere, but some of the machines that are running Linpack on Android, or some of the some of the uh, cell phones that are running Linpack Android, are certainly up above 80. Uh, you know, 65 at the top of the list, 80 megaflops. So they they might be at 100 megaflops when the um, when maybe the new um, Qualcomm. Uh, Processors start showing up in smartphones. So 100 megaflops ain't bad. If we could figure out some way, Linpack kind of wants to be run on a very tightly integrated uh, cluster. If you did a distributed Linpack, I'm not really sure what you'd what you'd be able to uh, to prove with that. It would it would take probably too long. The the network overhead would be too burdensome at that point. But certainly somebody's going to try it. Probably Jack Dungara. Um, here's oh yeah. So for, for these kind of machines, they're all 32 bit. So Uh, for like real world applications, like not, not benchmarks per se, but when you really want to have large data sets. Well, fortunately for us, nobody sells a product with four gigabytes available in it yet. So, <laughs> well, so <laughs> <a different problem. laughs> um, we think we might be able to do some clever shared memory over Ethernet kind of things, uh, or or some other. There's there's a lot of libraries out that we've kicked around. There's there's the Vismi library shared memory over InfiniBand. Um, obviously, we can't take advantage of InfiniBand. But, but I, I think we'll look at, at some, of these, some of these tricks. Maybe um, uh, Gene Cooperman's Rumi library is, uh, is, is another way to, to sort of, you know, a fake a 64 gigabit RAM subsystem. Um, but then your, your latency is I know, I know. And, uh, um, and, and latency really is our killer. We, it, for, for at least the applications that we have to run for supercomputing and the applications we're looking at for my day job at the lab, bandwidth is not an issue. I think we'd be fine with fast Ethernet, but yeah, latency is. And, uh, um, and for whatever reason, the chipsets we've got, um, certainly not single digit uh, you know, microsecond latencies. Uh, I, I've seen some drivers out there that claim we'll get there, but I don't think our chipset support them. But stay tuned. At the end of the summer, we will be done with our research, whether we want to be or not. So, because uh, <laughs> school starts back up. I was thinking pretty much the same thing. Um, I've seen benchmarks for geo systems running at 200 megahertz outpacing uh, Shiva plugs running at 800 just because of the memory architecture. Oh, really? Um, have you run into front side bus issues? Well, famous memory architecture. so what we want to do, we'll run all the HPC challenge stuff for, for supercomputing, but we'll also run all those benchmarks. The, um, the guys in Germany had a, a link to Van Smith's blog where he talked about the entire cornucopia of benchmark that you'll want to run to, to mm -hmm. demo whether or not. And I don't know, so I don't know which ones are going to point out our, our failings or not. Certainly from the HPC challenge, I guess Stream, Stream will point out one of our failings. We probably won't be able to stream very well. Um, there's a couple of I/O intensive uh, uh, tests in there. There's another suite of applications we have to run that Lincoln Lab has put out called the uh, HPEC challenge, the High Performance Embedded Computing Challenge. And we're going to look so like a uh, synthetic aperture radar is in there and, and some other things. So we'll see which ones. Uh, what what we think we're going to be good at is a good PE to RAM ratio. And so, so if we balance our, our compute uh, uh, and our combo time, so we find some way to, to optimize our chunking, we'll, we, we'll pass whatever benchmark that is with flying colors. And I'll dig up the Van Smith um, blog. He showed where, where uh, ARMS really did well against x86 on a, on a couple of things that, that were mostly, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 
the, he, he said what commands were really, you know, the, the divide works really well in Simdi on, on ARM, I guess. So I'll, I'll show you. And I, so we're looking for the application that will really, you know, demo this. The, um, uh, we're going to hook all of our stuff up to these, to these uh, uh, Watts up meters that have USB on them because there's a little Linux script that will let you, let you read what your cluster is using. I'll put this at the end of the cluster and we'll find out how much we're using. I think we have, a, we have a pretty good idea. We should be two watts per panda board. That's what we should be. And I think that's with full you know, CPU utilization. If we can find some more tricks, if we can find some ways to turn off everything on the, on the panda board that we're not using, maybe we can get it a little lower. All right, so here's, I'm quickly just gonna show you some then and now slides, what were once vices are now habits. And uh, for the longest time, at least Tom's hardware had an overclocking competition in Los Angeles. And so there was no shortage, if you went to this, I think it was at a university in LA somewhere, because there was no shortage of liquid nitrogen at these competitions. And what they'd do is they'd just give you like a stock CPU, and you'd, maybe you'd have to take a number two pencil and, and you know, reapply some jumpers <coughs> or something. But they said, here, you know, overclock <laughs> it as high as you can. And they'd routinely be able to overclock it, you know, at least 100% over, over stock. And so what this pointed out to the industry, I think, or maybe the industry already knew this, was the only reason we can't run these CPUs at higher clock rates is because we can't cool them. And that, so that's a fundamentally different problem. Cooling things is a fundamentally different problem than, than you know, <coughs> designing transistor layout. And so uh, uh, and there, there are whole classes of processors that you can, you can routinely overclock without exotic cooling. And then there's a bunch that you can with exotic cooling. So even if you do exotic cooling, one of the problems that we found out is that um, there's there's thermal gradients within the, the chip, right? So so let's say you're running a very floating point intensive benchmark. <coughs> yeah. The, the point in the chip where you have the floating point to it is like a bazillion degrees higher than what's right next to it, right? So this causes huge thermal gradients within the chip, and that causes causes reliability. Long term, yeah. If, if you know, you're running it for a short burst, is fine. But you want to consistently overclock it and run it at you take a three gigahertz chip and run it at six gigahertz for two years, you will have much higher higher failure rates. Than yep, and 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 permanent failures, right? Yeah, like permanent failures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So that that brings me to my to my now part. The um. <coughs> A lot of vendors are selling to Wall Street, and it says right on it, overclocked. And so, so what they're doing is, so what Wall Street was begging for, did you guys see this 60 Minutes episode on, on what Wall Street's using? Like the SEC is, start, is thinking of dictating the length of Ethernet cables in the data center. So it's, it's like ridiculous. So, what, yeah. so, so, so they, they, they came to Penguin and APRO and a couple of these other uh, 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 ISVs, and they said, look, this hard drive is rated for 100,000 hours. I don't, I don't need a three-year hard drive. I need, I need a cluster that's going to pay for itself by me getting a trade in 15 microseconds before the next guy, and then we'll move on to the next generation. So they, so they, they said, look, just tell me what overclocking these various subsystems, like, like the hard drives, maybe we make them run twice as fast as the spec. Um, what will that do to the life expectancy? Um, you know, and since we're buying so many of them, it's a statistical issue anyhow. And they said, well, you know, you get half the life out of that hard drive. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's overclock them. And so they're doing this on all the subcomponents of these clusters now. And as you might expect, the OEMs here, the um, Intel and AMD isn't saying, okay, well, you know, fine, just pass our, our uh, you know, pass our warranty through. APRO is saying, we've, okay, we're violating warranty on half of this stuff. We'll give you a different warranty. And I don't know what that is, but clearly it's uh, clearly it's something Wall Street's willing to pay for. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a 15-day warranty. You know. <laughs> 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 it's yeah, it's like the the, <laughs> the the first triple witching weekend warranty. Okay, so 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 here's another one. The um, there was a bunch of cool tests with the Doctor Freeze project, and you can go. There's at least there's grcooling.com and Puget Systems. You can buy uh, a system now, and they they do a lot of custom work. They have they have a a, a cluster down at TAC at, at Texas Advanced Computing Center, and these things are fully immersed in mineral oil, and everything's in there. 
you know, uh, the, the cables run in there. You've, there's probably a standoff of maybe four or five inches here. They have heat sinks on the processors because even though it's in mineral oil, you still gotta, gotta you know, open that space up for the, for the processor to cool off. Now, they're not doing this to, to overclock. Uh, I, I think maybe those experiments are probably around the corner. They're doing this uh, to, to remove some HVAC from their data center. And, uh, and they've got customers and, uh, and documentable, repeatable results. So, this, so mineral cooling may be, um, may be in the data center's future. And this is one of my favorites because they finally had a resolution. I, I, can, I can defer to Thomas on this one. There was finally a revol resolution to the, to the Sony lawsuit against George Hotz. So, so a bunch of new, new Linuxes hit the streets after, like, like a, a week after it was resolved. Somebody emailed me and said, hey, one of the guys that was a named litigant in the Sony lawsuit, uh, Hector Marcan, I think Marcan's like his middle name. So Marcan wrote a Linux that the, the Linux that you, you used to be able to run that came from, uh, that, that Sony authorized, wouldn't utilize all the SPEs on your PlayStation. Well, his Linux can. So all of a sudden, the AFRL got, you know, 17% more uh, performance out of their 3,000 node PlayStation cluster <coughs> by running this new Linux that would access all eight SPEs instead of just seven. Um, so I think I, that this was, this was a remarkable piece of history. They, uh, the AFRL published their results. They, they certainly would have been on the top 500 if, if uh, um, I don't think they ran Linpack, but they, they could have. This, uh, this was a sort of a semi-classified project, so they didn't want to run, uh, you know, didn't want to make it too popular. But they did have a press announcement when they did the ribbon cutting on Condor. But so, so I, I, I think what, what the homebrew hackers did for the PlayStation is probably going to have, have effects for some time to come because there's a lot of PlayStations out there. And for people who have lost faith in Sony because they can't keep their data secure, I suppose these things are going to be on eBay f forever. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and those are the ones you want to buy because if you're doing clustering, you don't need Blu-ray, you don't need half of the things that, that break on them. So, so you can buy a, a used PlayStation for $30, dollars Oh, is that right? The, the used market? Yeah. Oh, they're going to flash them to some up, upgrade on the firmware? Yep, they're going to be um, tracking owners who try to sell them and then flashing uh, basically bricking devices that people try to sell. Really? <laughs> so I just wanted to... Buy Sony products. I have a lot of slides to horrify people. This was a cluster. I used to work in microwave um, when I was only a part-time employee here. Um, University of Maine bought this thing called the Black Bear Cluster, and they had a purpose-built, this was quite visionary in them, purpose-built building up there that the roof would open up when they needed a lot of cold air. Uh, <laughs> they had louvers in the roof. And they, so it turns out they need a lot of cold air pretty much every season. Um, because uh, this, was, this was Marinette, and they had these spline, they called them line cards and spline cards, so they made... Uh, MIT is the only place that calls a fat tree a fat tree. Everybody else calls them class networks. So this was a class network where everybody could see each other and it would spread out and you could see each other through no more than, um, than two uh, switches. So, and of course, Marinette, tough to beat the latency on Marinette. For years, Marinette owned the, the physics uh, supercomputing industry which was a lot of it back then, because the you know the the pretty much theoretically uh, low latencies on, on on their kind of optical design. Now you can get that for a lot less. I mean, InfiniBand is is an optical technology that's uh, substantially cheaper than MirrorNet, but MirrorNet was was the exclusive low latency network provider for supercomputing for years. Um, this is pretty much all of my prepared stuff. I have. Um, I have some other stuff if you want to hang around about the project that uh, that me and the, stu oh, the students split on me. Oh, they're getting a lousy grade. <laughs> 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 so no, um, so I can show you some of the stuff we plan on doing with with some of these uh, by probably the end of this month. I'm going to have a variety of Shiva plugs and Pogo plugs, everything that's built to that form factor. Um, I think I'll at least have access to these. Um, 
to like the ZT Systems quality clusters. I bet there's a company in Austin, Texas called Calceda. Have you guys seen these guys? They're talking about building a you know a 400. Uh, I think it's a 400 node ARM cluster that that um, I don't think they're going to be ready by by our time frame, but maybe by September um, they'll have that on the street. So you're going to see fully turnkey cluster systems just like we did at the Beowulf cluster revolution and the and the Beowulf cluster with GPUs revolution. People are going to be selling you high performance computing clusters that will satisfy all your needs. Uh, the double precision trick will be built into it, um, but certainly if you need single precision, they're ready to go today. And, uh, and hopefully this summer we'll find out what some of the gotchas are on the suite of things we have to look at. We've got four applications that we, that we do need to compile, um, a co cosmological app and a, a weather prediction app and, and some of these other things that are kind of demonstrative of what you can do with your hardware. Um, but we'll also run these lint packs, and hopefully I'll be able to report back in, in August or September. Maybe, maybe when we have the tablet wars, I'll have some, some data on this. I think, I really think, if not this year, certainly November, we're gonna, gonna present our stuff at Supercomputing. By next year, you'll have the ARM Cortex-A15, which is a really unbelievable processor. I think, it, I think it's a quad-core ARM, and it's got, uh, it, it, what, wider bus? Is it a 64-bit? Um, it's not quite 64-bit from what I've heard. Okay. But it gets you, gets you past 32 bits. Yes. Okay. So we are like 36 bits or something, something <laughs> number like that. Um, yeah. Thirty six bits is not. Yeah. And yeah. you still get, you know, what, sixteen times more than four. So you are getting sixty four gigabytes, right? So <laughs> it's plenty for what what is being used now, right? Is it segmented? No, it's not. Oh yeah, yeah, and those will be uh, is that next generation Tegra or something or what? Yeah, there's Tegra three. Tegra three, um, okay. Code yep. Yep. I'd like to. I, I think we're going to find out this summer who has the the market share of of uh, processors and cell phones. I would assume it's Qualcomm, right? Qualcomm, yeah, mm -hmm. especially with the next gen Snapdragons. Yep. Um, that's in every device except Motorola's. Okay. So they're dominating on that front. TI's new um, OMAPs. Yep. Um, OMAP there's fours. rumors. Hmm? OMAP fours. Yeah. Yep. There's rumors that Motorola is going to be switching from Tegros to OMAPs with their um, quarter four and quarter one 2012 devices. Yep. Um, but it's really up in the air. Uh, there's some issues spreading around that um, rumors spreading around that the Tegras don't work with um, Verizon's 4G LTE, so Motorola may ditch them to go with the ATIs. Really? That's no small account, Motorola. Especially when they're advertising my Zoom as being 4G compatible, oh, yeah. and um, it's supposed to have 30-day upgrade. Uh, sorry, 90 days upgrade, and uh, it's been 115, still no upgrade. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's bad news. So uh, I smell a lawsuit pretty soon. Yeah. So Thomas is trying to hack, uh, he's trying to make his Zoom dual boot uh, Android and Ubuntu. Uh, haven't quite done it yet, but maybe by August. I've got a CHRU's virtual machine running right now, but uh, still working on the boot image. Yeah. You coming to our meeting in August? Yep. Good. All right. Well, thank you. Like I say, I'm going to hang around. Um, I can show you the picture of the strong box. And I, I may have, Sandia said they're going to send me, it's, it's like four rails of, uh, yeah, it's like four rails of, of 40 or 50 gumsticks. I think they're going to send me a rail because they'd like to see, they'd, they'd like to find out what kind of optimizations we're doing too. So maybe by the time we get our cluster built, it'll have four or five different architectures and all, all ARM variants. But, uh, but I've, I've read some great stuff about gumsticks. They're e easy to work with and they're certainly dense. So. So I can show you some of that. Thank you.